And good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute, Lord Moore, Oklahoma, and I truly appreciate you being with me. I hope that you'll like, I hope that you will share the video, and uh, let your friends and your neighbors know. Uh, listen, I, I have had any number of people, <laughs> this is so funny, I've had any number of co people contact me through the years and say, listen, the only reason I tuned in to watch you was to see what this crazy guy had to say who was saying all prophecy is fulfilled. And I was just going to watch you to prove my friend wrong, my friend who said, man, you got to watch this guy, he's crazy. And now they're full preterists. <laughs> uh, one of my very good friends uh, did exactly that. The only reason, the only reason he started following what I was saying was to prove me wrong for other people. And he found out he couldn't do that. And he is literally on fire, proclaiming and sharing the news of God's faithfulness in keeping his promises. It's absolutely wonderful. Okay, we are continuing our study of the challenge of Christ. John chapter 10, verse 37. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me, believe me for my works. That's very simple. And yet, amazingly enough, there are some who call themselves Christians who attack my videos and who attack my argumentation on this channel saying that only applied to those that Jesus was talking to then. Huh. Well, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, those things that I have spoken unto you, taught unto you, commit thou unto faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. So there's kind of a generational type of a thing. There's an ongoing teaching. And so are we genuinely supposed to believe that the challenge of Christ only applied to one generation? If that were a legitimate argument, then we could say, okay, uh, the challenge of Christ only applied to one generation. That is to say, uh, we're not supposed to believe, that is to say, the people of the first century, only the first century, we're not to believe in Jesus if he did not do what he said he was going to do. He said he was going to be raised from the dead. Uh, if he wasn't raised, they're not supposed to believe in him. But that has nothing to do with us today. You see how utterly ridiculous and illogical such an argument is? We're supposed to believe Jesus today because he said he was going to be raised from the dead. Not because he was. See, that's the logic. It, you can't even call that logic, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, this challenge of Christ, we have been focusing on demonstrating that the challenge of Christ applies to the, his promise of his parousia, his coming, his coming in judgment, and the resurrection. Oh, goodness gracious, allergies are terrible. Pardon me. And we have been showing that there is an incredibly important word used in the Septuagint of the Old Testament, used in the Greek New Testament. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And that word, that incredibly significant word, is the Greek word kairos. The word kairos means designated divinely appointed time. You see, in the Greek, there are different words for time. You have chronos, which is, and can, pardon me, can be time generically considered. It can be any old time. It can refer to the entire span of time from the beginning of creation onward. That's chronos. It's the word that we get our word chronology from, obviously. But it's different from the Greek word kairos. Kairos is divinely appointed time. 
I've shared with you how the book of Daniel, which influences the New Testament writers so tremendously much, the book of Daniel speaks very eloquently and powerfully of the Kairos. Daniel chapter 2, four kingdoms are delineated. In the days of the fourth kingdom, the, and as God divinely appointed his narrative, in the days of the fourth empire, the days of the fourth kingdom, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's the fourth kingdom. That's the Kairos. Daniel chapter 7, once again, four kingdoms. In the days of the fourth kingdom, the days of Rome, the little horn would arise, persecute the saints. The coming of the Son of Man would destroy the little horn, and the kingdom would be given to the saints. That's the divinely appointed time. Daniel chapter 9 has been the focus of our attention now for get a little bit. Seventy weeks are determined. The Hebrew word, translated as determined, is kitzhak. And it literally means cut out. Okay? That in the overall stream of chronos, the overall stream of time, God looked down the, through the stream of time and he said, from here to here. The 70 weeks. That is my divinely appointed time to put away sin, to make the atonement, to finish the transgression, to seal vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Six constituent elements, ladies and gentlemen, that were determined to occur within the parameters of that divinely appointed time. We've been focused over the last couple of weeks on that fourth element, to seal vision and prophecy. Or is that the third one? Anyway, you get the idea. To seal vision and prophecy. Well, in the, in the Septuagint, Again, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. It is soon to Leah of the vision and the prophet. Soon to Leah means consummation. To bring it to its fullness, but to complete it. And as the huge majority of commentators agree, and it's interesting that, uh, it's really interesting how uh, scholars try to avoid the implications and the ramifications of their own comments. Because you see, many commentators try to apply Daniel chapter 9 and the sealing of vision and prophecy to the days of Antiochus Epiphanes. And so thus you find commentators saying, well, Daniel is being told that in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, which would be the time of the end, all vision and all prophecy would be sealed up, closed up, no more vision, no more prophecy, because everything would be fulfilled. But of course, Daniel was wrong. The prophecy was wrong. As a matter of fact, one very noted modern-day scholar, commentator on the book of Daniel, going through the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11 specifically, says now from, from the following verses to the following verses, we know that it's genuine prophecy because it didn't come true. That's right. That's what he says. It's genuine prophecy because it didn't come true. Now, folks, you could not find a more biased, prejudicial comment anywhere at any time. But you see, the underlying assumption of such scholars is there's no such thing as genuine, inspired, infallible prophecy. And so, the way they know that an Old Testament personage, an Old Testament, quote, prophet, unquote, was actually making a prophecy is if his prophecy failed. If it came true, seemingly, then that must mean that he was writing after the fact and writing his epistle or writing his pericope, whatever it happened to be, 
from a post facto perspective, but making it appear as if it was a prophecy. Once again, you will felt seldom ever find anything more prejudicial, more presuppositional than that. And it won't stand up to scrutiny. But anyway, so Daniel was told 70 weeks are determined to seal vision and prophecy. Well, once again, the meaning of seal vision and prophecy means to bring vision and prophecy to its consummation. Suntalia. Meaning that the office of prophet and the giving of inspired prophecy would come to an end by the fulfillment of all prophecy. So I've been sharing with you how the rest of the Bible, how the rest of the, and specifically in the New Testament, we have many passages that point to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 as the time for the fulfillment of all prophecy. My newest book, These Are the Days When All Things Must Be Fulfilled, is one of the most in-depth exegesis of Luke chapter 21, verse 22, that you'll find anywhere. I'm not aware of another book like it by anyone. It's available on my website. So, in Luke chapter 21, verse 22, Jesus predicting the fall of Jerusalem, and let me make this comment, even dispensationalists admit that in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 to 24, Jesus is talking about A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus, in describing that event, said, These be the days of vengeance in which all things that are written must be fulfilled. You wouldn't believe, and in the book that I just mentioned, my, my newest book, uh, well, not really my newest, on no November the 1st, just a few days away, I will be formally making available and introducing my very latest book, over for almost 500 pages, entitled Resurrection Feast Fulfilled, a study of the relationship between Israel's last feast day, Sukkot, and the resurrection. You've been waiting for it. I've been waiting for it. I'm thrilled to announce the book is ready to be published. My inventory is supposed to be in on November the 1st. I will be offering a very, very special introductory price for you to save at least $10 on the book. That means it includes free shipping. Okay. So be watching for that in just a few days, just a few days. But in the book, these are the days when all things must be fulfilled. I document how Jesus really did mean that in the fall of Jerusalem, all things written would be fulfilled. All prophecy would be fulfilled. Prophecy, vision, and the prophet would be sealed up, consummated. Boy, that's powerful. We've gone from there to Revelation chapter 11, 10 and 11. All right? Chapter 10. In the days of the sounding, one angel, you know, the angels speak to one another. Uh, let, me, let me read that for you once again to kind of refresh your, your mind. Verse 5. I saw an angel and I saw one stand upon the sea and upon the earth who lifted up his hand to heaven. And swear by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and things that are therein, the earth and the things that are therein, the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be no time no, no longer. Now, I've already demonstrated to you, it's not saying that this is about the end of time. It's literally, in as many translations rendered, there should be no more delay. No more delay in what? Next verse. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared unto his servants, the prophets. So in the seventh sounding of the seventh trumpet, no more delay, but the mystery of God foretold by the prophets would be fulfilled. It had been delayed, as in 
the fulfillment taking a long time. But now in the seventh trumpet, no more delay. Now, I shared with you in last week's video that I used to believe that the reference to the mystery of God here was almost exclusively to the consummation and the perfection of Jew and Gentile equality in the body of Christ. Now, make no mistake, in the New Testament, the mystery of God is defined as Jew-Gentile equality in the body of Christ. Make no mistake, Paul saw the bringing about of that equality as his distinctive function, role, and ministry. Okay? Colossians 1, 24 to 27. Well, I'm no longer convinced that the mystery of God referred to in Revelation chapter 10 refers exclusive, exclusively to Jew and Gentile equality in the body of Christ. Now, does it include that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's not all it refers to. How do I know that? Because in Revelation chapter 11, and I, I got to tell you, you know, I, I've said this before here on Now TV. Uh, this passage is one of my favorites. That passage is one of my favorites, etc. And uh, as is generally speaking the case, whatever passage I happen to be focused on and have been spending a lot of time on exegeting, that's really kind of my favorite passage at the time. In spite of that, <laughs> in spite of that, I have to tell you, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 to 19, has to be, in my estimation, one of the most powerful eschatological texts possibly imaginable. Now, why is that? Let's read it together, shall we? Let me start with verse 14, okay? The second woe is passed, the third woe comes quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. Wait a minute, seventh angel. What's he going to sound? The seventh trumpet. What happens in the sounding of the seventh trumpet? The mystery of God foretold by the prophets is completed. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall... Pardon me, he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats uh, fell upon their faces and they worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and were and you were and you are to come, because you have taken to thee your great power and have reigned. And the nations were angry, and the and your wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you should give them reward, uh, give your reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear your name, small and great, and you should draw destroy them which dwell on the earth, or which destroy the earth, excuse, excuse me. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple temple the ark of his testimony, and there were lightnings and thunders, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. Wow, what an incredible text. So, in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, finished, consummated, soon to Leah. In the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, let's see. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall rule forever and ever. What did I say? Oh, the nations were angry. Your wrath has come. The time of the dead that they should be judged, that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear your name, small or great, and the temple of God in heaven was opened. Folks, those constituent elements can, can almost be said to be the summary of the eschatological story. We need to go back to Matthew chapter 4. 
Jesus is in the wilderness. Satan approaches him, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment. And he says, if you will but bow down and worship me, I shall give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus, of course, responded, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only you shall worship. Jesus refused to take the kingdom from Satan, who is called in Ephesians chapter 2, the ruler of this world in the first century. Jesus wanted to receive the kingdom from the Father. He wanted to receive the kingdom by accomplishing the work which the Father had given him to do. And so he came and he said, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. That meant that the time for the confrontation between Satan and heaven had come. The great spiritual warfare between heaven and Satan, that time had come. Jesus came knowing that he had to go, as it were, eyeball to eyeball, toenail to toenail with Satan. He had to defeat Satan. And thus in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus cast the demons out of a young man. He was accused of doing that by the power of Satan. And he said, if Satan is divided against Satan, can his kingdom stand? A house divided against itself cannot stand. No man is able to destroy the house of a strong man unless he first bind him. Jesus, by casting that demon out, was demonstrating that he, as Luke chapter 11 puts it, it's, it's really, really a humorous type, type of thing. It's kind of a parallel with the story of Matthew chapter 12. He is accused of casting out the demon by the power of Satan. But Jesus said, if I, by the power of God, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then surely the kingdom of heaven has drawn near or is among you. You know, the imagery there is, you know, I'm casting out demons with my little pinky. Ain't no big deal. <laughs> I'm not even breaking a sweat, guys. Which meant that the victory was assured. Absolutely, he totally assured. In John chapter 12, 31 and 32, as Jesus prepared to go to the cross. Now, mind you, Satan had entered Peter to try to prevent Jesus' death. Because you see, Satan knew. Satan knew that Jesus came into this world to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. And so Jesus said, what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, deliver me from this hour? For this reason was I born. For this reason did I come into this world. Jesus came to die because he knew that by offering himself as a perfect spiritual sacrifice on the behalf of all mankind, since all men sinned, and, and the death penalty on every sinner is the reality. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. The only sacrifice that could offer any hope for any man is a perfect substitutionary death. And thus Christ was made to be sin, a sin offering, literally, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God has made him to be sin, a sin offering for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a glorious, beautiful, wonderful concept, and yet shocking all at the same time. Jesus came to give himself the sacrifice, to win the victory over Satan, 
having died and bore our sins in his body on the cross. First Timothy or first Peter chapter 2, 21 and following. He was able to be raised from the dead because sin could death could not hold him. Why? Because he was sinless. Sinless. And thus he won the victory. So in John chapter 12, 31 and 32, as Jesus is preparing to die, Jesus said, now is the judgment of the God of this world. Now is the God of this world judged and cast out. You see, Jesus saw his death, his burial, and his resurrection as the means of victory. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Seeing then that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, as the writer has discussed the great men and women of faith of the old covenant who were persecuted for their faith but refused to renounce. He says, seeing then that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us therefore lay aside the weight, the sin that does so easily beset us and look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now watch this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, he triumphed. He won. And as a result of his victory, he could shed forth the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost because he was now seated on the throne of David. And he was king of kings and lord of lords. This is involved in Revelation chapter 11, ladies and gentlemen, every bit of it having to do with the fulfillment of the old covenant promises of the coming of the Messiah, his offering of himself as a sacrifice, Isaiah chapter 53, being enthroned at the right hand of the uh, in the heavens as king of kings and lord of lords to come back in judgment so that he can deliver the kingdom to the Father, fulfilling all prophecy. I'm completely out of time for today. We'll pick, up, pick this up again next week. See you then.